Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. I am actually recording in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which some of you uh, may recall that I record from here uh, exactly once a year, uh, right around this time every year, because I'm out here for what's called the Acton University Symposium, this rather large economics conference put on by the Acton Institute. And I speak every year, and in addition to giving my lecture, I uh, meet with a number of other folks, clients, and, and friends and colleagues. Uh, this uh, the whole faculty is riddled with other economists that I become uh, friendly with or, or think real highly of or whatnot. And so it's a great week of, or at least a great few days of um, opportunity to kind of dialogue with, with other like-minded economists and uh, then, of course, to share my perspective on the chosen topic. Um, but I'm not here to talk to you all about my Acton lecture. We're here to talk market stuff, and I'm recording into the late portion of the market day on Thursday. And as I sit here and talk, the S&P 500 is now at an all-time high, um, at least in terms of intraday. We don't know where it will close today, and we judge these things generally by, by their closing price levels. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it's been a, a pretty significant week to the upside in markets. The reasoning being, uh, A, a little renewed hope that the Trump call as it pertains to the trade war is looking to be headed in the right direction. Uh, there, there is a planned meeting now that's official with President Trump and President Xi of China uh, in, in um, uh, uh, the G20 meeting next week. And so to the extent that uh, that meeting doesn't create a big disappointment, I would imagine with no guarantees that it at least increases the odds that there will be a uh, suspension of the next round of tariffs that they will hold off there. I don't expect that those talks are going to generate the lasting resolution that we ultimately would like to see here. But the fact of the matter is that um, not having that meeting would have probably been taken as a negative sign. This at least allows for some pause in the, uh, in the escalated trade war. But I think the bigger issue in the markets this week is the uh, Fed. And, and ironically, the, the Fed did not raise rates at their meeting on Wednesday. And some might have thought the market would be disappointed by that. The market was not expecting the Fed to raise rates. And, and frankly, um, they didn't need to because the market – did what uh, it, uh, what the Fed did, what they often do, and that's use rhetoric as their monetary device. They essentially use their words to indicate that they absolutely will be raising rates, and it had that sort of stimulative effect. Um, the Fed funds futures market, it, as of right now, is is pricing a 100% chance of a Fed funds decrease, a rate cut in the month of July. Uh, there's also a very, very high chance price stand, not 100%, but in the 70s or 80s, that there will be a second rate cut at some point in the next several months. So one way or the other, whether they cut half a point next month or two different quarter point cuts, that within a few months were a half a point lower than we are right now. And I talk a lot this week in DividendCafe.com in our weekly commentary about the tension that exists um, around the message of we have strong economic growth relative to where we've been. We have earnings growth. You have all these positives in the economy, and then you have the Fed decreasing. And it seems that there's a contradiction there. You have bond yields very low. The U.S. 10-year Treasury is now just below 2%. You got a one-handle, 1.99% 1 or something in the 10-year there's negative yields um, in Germany and Japan and other places. So there, there seems to be a contradiction between the bond market and the stock market are saying. And I think that what the tension points to is that each are pricing in a different timeline around reality. The bond market, when it looks out into the future, uh, is saying that the return, because of the debt overhang, and the deflationary pressures that exist into the economy, headwinds for global growth in other parts of the world as well. Uh, I would add the trade war tensions are there. The um, European Union's banking system is sort of on the precipice. That it indicates 
uh, enough headwind and concern uh, that that it, it believes you could see a return on capital that is lower than a cost of capital. But but then in the short term, the Fed trying to alter the cost of capital, keep it lower so that businesses have incentive to invest and, and, and grow and stimulate. Uh, that, that kind of spread between cost of capital and return on capital is driving the Fed, but they can't control the return on capital. They can't control market forces. So they focus on the other side of the equation. And that can, in the short term, be very stimulative. And it, and it can affect sentiment, but it can also affect market valuation or market multiple. So you can't say that the Fed doesn't have an impact because they do short term. But then you also have these kind of longer term structural and I would argue deflationary concerns. And so the tension point between stock and bond market is the same tension point investors may have. That which they may be concerned about longer term um, is different than what may be opportunistic shorter term. And that which they may be uh, in other phases of this process may be concerned about shorter term is different than what may, may be opportunistic longer term. And reconciling those two things is how asset allocations, meaning an investment construction, are supposed to get formed. That's sort of our job at the Bonson Grill. But it's not easy to do right now because there are tension points between stock market, bond market, economic uh, indicators that are positive and indicators that are negative, short-term considerations and longer term. And so these things represent tensions that have to be resolved around a particular investor's goals and timeline and, and whatnot. But that, I think, is really the lay of the land in the economy right now, is the return on capital versus the cost of capital and the kind of intervening forces that are at play. The government wants to see a higher return on capital, so they have corporate tax cuts and they have deregulation. The, the Federal Reserve wants to see a lower cost of capital but then they don't want to create malinvestment and they don't want to create inflation. And so they've kind of gone back and forth in the, just within the last six months, uh, at this point, maybe eight months, you know, very focused on tightening to now very focused on the opposite. And so I, I kind of expect a lot of people are going to be very happy with the way June has turned out. Uh, of course, that could change in the next week, but with about a week to go in the market month of June, I think people are going to be pretty pleased, pretty surprised at what happened after that month of May. Um, but I don't feel pessimistic or optimistic about it. I think that this is the tug of war and the enhanced volatility we're going to have for some time. First and foremost, that trade war issue still has to get resolved. Secondly, um, there is no chance that the overall debt overhang is going to go anywhere anytime soon. Well, very likely not for the rest of my life. And so dealing with how you have, are going to be a, basically see organic growth surface in a complex global economy uh, that has some demand pressures because of, of excessive debt, um, th those, th there's going to be a lot uh, to be said about these issues in the, in the years and decades to come. Ultimately, Investors need cash flow, and they need it either in the present or the future. And we obviously believe in our investment philosophy, we're able to address those things and protect those things in a reasonably all-weather sense from an economic standpoint. But all-weather is important right now. It's a buzz term that a lot of people use to say, oh, we can do well in any environment. Well, I don't know that anyone can ever do well in any environment unless they're predicting exactly where things are growth or no growth, inflation or deflation. Um, I'm not trying to pick a quadrant to be in around the growth and, and inflation debates. I'm more saying that we want to be as defensive as we can be about any of those outcomes and yet not cut off our access to what can go right and what we think will go right ultimately in a free enterprise system. Uh, and so the growth of dividends becomes just absolutely pivotal to where we're trying to take client portfolios. So uh, that's the state of affairs right now in the economy. I'm going to leave you alone here, get back to some of my uh, work. Uh, do feel free to check out DividendCafe.com for the written commentary. There's a couple other issues in addition to all this I get into. And um, obviously a handful of charts and visuals that may be uh, beneficial, um, including a bull market versus bear market watch, a whole chart of a checklist of things I'd like you to look at. 
And then the Divin Cafe podcast goes through all this in audio form and and uh, kind of different content than what I just gave you here in the video. Uh, whether it's a video or podcast you like or both, um, all I'd ask is that you subscribe or, you know, kind of get it regularly fed into your player feeder, you know, all the list, uh, all that subscription stuff. It helps us. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I think you guys get sick of me saying that every week, but I kind of have to. I hope you understand. Okay, thank you very much for watching the Dividend Cafe video. And uh, please reach out with any questions or comments you may have. A lot going on. This is an extraordinary time for us to be engaged in markets. And I assure you, engaged is what we are. Thanks. Thank you.